Hello and welcome back to The Benchmark. I'm Kali Jugu. We've been speaking with the president and chairman of the Ethiopian Global Initiative, Samuel Gebru. Uh, I wanted to pick up back on our, our discussion about development. Mm -hmm. um, but further than that, what's, what's honestly, if, if you can talk about it, what's been the most challenging um, facet of EGI, running EGI? Um, because like we discussed, you're so young um, and development there are huge bureau bureaucracies that deal with many challenges and the fact that you know it's it's a very small team that you have what's been the most challenging aspect of is that challenging know? professionally or personally both <laughs> yeah. both i mean i'm sure that because this has essentially been your child you know mm -hmm. you have a lot of close ties to to its inception mm -hmm. so in both ways i, I think when it, when it comes to being personal the organization has consumed me mm. in many ways, I mean, as you can imagine. And as a result, um, you know, I, you know, looking back from being 13 and now 19, two things strike me. First is, it's almost as if I grew up too quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, didn't really have that opportunity to just be a kid. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is, um, also, when it comes to the uh, you know time that I spend with family and friends and you know other people that you know you would care about, um, that has become severely diminished mm -hmm. because of uh, you know being with uh, the organization. Oh, yeah. So on the personal level, it's it's definitely been as if I grew up too quickly. I you know there were certain things that I just didn't enjoy as a child. Mm -hmm. um, looking back, uh, I don't say I regret it, but I think you know there would have been different things I would have done. So, you know, the, the time consumption is a very big thing. Oh, yeah. um, and also with the family. Uh, on the professional level, um, two things also strike me. The first thing is really uh, learning as you go is, a, is always a difficult thing. Uh, there's always times when, you know, I just, I wish I knew something that I have to learn before I know. And, you know, sometimes we do it by trial and error. Right. Host an event, no one attends. You realize what you did wrong. The next time, you get the whole house. So, you know, certain things like that sometimes, and you get disappointed when people don't attend. Mm -hmm. And uh, you get disappointed when you don't reach your target um, uh, fundraising goal. So that's definitely one thing. Then the other thing, too, is also, when it comes to the capacity, it's been very difficult to manage EGI, um, not only as a student, but also um, virtually. We have people all, all over. Oh, yeah. Uh, and as a result, you know, I'll be awake sometimes at 3 a.m. Uh, talking to our folks in Addis Ababa. Hmm. Or I will be awake uh, at very odd times during the day or uh, be busy during some odd times during the weekend because of the organization. Uh, you know, whenever it's, we're talking to people, our, our contacts in Europe or Africa or in, even in uh, Asia, uh, what I have to do is accommodate their schedules. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult because you lose that personal interaction we're not in one big office building, so I can't just run down to your office and give you a piece of paper. I have to email it, so we right. lose that personal touch. And I think on the professional development standpoint, it's difficult because it's hard to train your organization's uh, members when they're not under one roof. Mm -hmm. And on the other token, what's been the most rewarding aspect of EGI? On the professional level, the, I think the most rewarding aspect is that things are shaping up. And when I say that, I, I mean it holistically. Our, our projects are coming to light. We're getting some amazing people who are managing these projects. Uh, each project has its own project manager. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not actually involved in the uh, direct affairs of each one, mm -hmm. which is great because I want that. I want everyone to be a part of the organization. I want that delegation to happen. So it's important that we have a skilled group of people that are at the helm of the initiative. And then on the, prof on the personal level, uh, aside from meeting great people like yourself, <laughs> uh, you. I, I think uh, one thing that definitely is important is that I'm following what I want to mm. do. You know, uh, I think uh, one thing that we tend to forget is that we put money, we put success together. And as a result, we end up compromising our core values, our, right. our core beliefs. And for me, uh, this past semester, I took a uh, business ethics class. It's called Ethics and Moral Leadership. And if there's one thing I learned that will forever change me, it's uh, when we were talking about 
uh, kind of pursuing your interests. Mm -hmm. I, I found it very interesting that most people, when they retire at the age of 65 or whatnot, they face a personal dilemma because they don't know what they're going to do at the next stage of their yeah. life. Because most of us humans, we end up following a job description. We end up following a resume mm -hmm. our entire life. And as a result, sometimes we compromise our core values, our core passions. And, and I think what ends up happening is that our talents are not used. Mm -hmm. We're using our skills. I know how to write, I know how to speak. Perfectly, right. great. But am I really doing what drives me? Am I waking up every day saying that this is going to be what I want to do forever? I'm never retiring. And for me, that's, that's exactly what it is. So on the, on the personal level, it's been a rewarding experience. And you know, I'm talking like I'm 50 years old right now, yeah. but I think it's important for <laughs> <laughs> said that because my next question is that you also besides your responsibilities with EGI you you work in consulting you, you essentially are a freelance consultant yeah. um, and you you participate in speaking engagements um, you help with project implementation how is it and, and the issues range from social cultural political how is it that at 19 years old that you've been already put in a position where there are people who I'm sure your grandparents age that you're consulting yeah. I mean it really is like you're 50 years old yeah. it, you know and, and that's a part of as I told you with the growing up too quickly mm. and and I, I don't regret it though I actually enjoy it um, one thing in our culture is uh, one very negative thing I think of, of being an Ethiopian is you have this uh, sort of a notion that you are a youth you don't know anything mm. you know um, you know, in Amharic, they would say, <laughs> You know, you are a kid, you don't know anything. Right, right. And as a result, sometimes you get discouraged. I've, I've gotten discouraged. So part of it is this drive to disprove them. Mm -hmm. But on the, on the broader level, it's, it's this idea that age doesn't matter. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't. Um, there are many young people that do great work. And just because you are 18 or 19 or 30 or 40 shouldn't discourage you from doing anything. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one uh, fun example is uh, back in February, I was in Los Angeles for a EGI fundraiser. And uh, the special guest at the event was a former Los Angeles city councilor and a former uh, California state representative, uh, Councilor Nathan Holden. And Councilor Holden uh, said something that was very interesting. When I was talking to him about the organization's history and when I told him that you know, I was 13 when I started this work, he looked at me and he said, you know Samuel, you're kind of late in the game. I was nine years old when I started community activism. And, and I laughed and I said, well, you know, counselor, we're not all the same. <laughs> but uh, I, I thought that was quite interesting because that's a great example of somebody who has made an entire career right. out of public service. Mm -hmm. Councillor Holden, in fact, actually, the reason why he was there was because he named that area Little Ethiopia. And that's his, that's his mark mm -hmm. to the Ethiopian community. He represented that area, and the Ethiopians came to him and they said, we would like recognition. And he said, Little Ethiopia, consider it done. Mm -hmm. And he was able to post uh, you know, the, the signs and the highways and, and the street entrance and everything saying that this is Little Ethiopia. It belongs to the Ethiopian community for the great economic development that they've done on Fairfax Avenue. And, and I think for us to, to see that is amazing because there are many people who start young. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, at, at the risk of sounding cliche, you, you look at people like, for instance, Oprah Winfrey. She was a young reporter. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at Steve Jobs from Apple. He was 17 or 18 when he started his business. Uh, in fact, let's give you an Ethiopian example. Uh, the um, Bowflex, the home gym system. An Ethiopian invented that. He was a college student, Tasema Shaferau. He goes by the nickname Dosho. And Tasema was a college student in California when he came up with the idea. He marketed it to these different uh, exercise companies and they all laughed him out saying that this wouldn't work. But look at where it is today. He sold it and it's an amazing company. Microsoft, uh, you know, Yahoo, Google, all these greats in the world started off young. Right. Yeah. But you, I mean, the, the difference is, is that they started young with an interest that was very introspective. And, and what you've been doing is, is very much so socially conscious and it affects people directly. So I think that that's what really sets you apart. 
And if I may ask, what's been the most challenging aspect of being so public so early on and about issues that are easily very controversial? I mean, especially on your blog, you're very, yeah. open, very open about your opinions. Yeah. I, what what are some challenges about that? And are you uh, are you fearful fearful at all of what repercussions may uh, come from being so open? Yeah. Well, fearful no. I, I, I'm known to be a daredevil. I say what I want. Mm -hmm. I speak my mind. I'm very direct, open. Some people don't like it, but I think um, it's important to be open. You, you need that open relationship. Uh, and I surround myself with equally open people uh, that are able to criticize me right. at any point, and I take it. Um, so there's that level that you don't need to be sentimental about everything you do, particularly your work. Um, and for me, I think the most challenging thing has been that because you're public, because people monitor your every movement, mm -hmm. basically, um, you really have to watch what you're saying. You right. have to watch what you're doing. You have to watch what photograph is taken of you. I mean, you know, where you're at, what you're doing at any moment. Um, you know, a, a good friend of mine uh, gave me advice a few years ago. She said, always live your life like there is a microscope pointed at it that everybody is watching your every movement. Mm -hmm. And I know it sounds very scary almost, a big brother type, but uh, to, to a level it is important because, um, you know, no doubt there are great people out there that are role models. And the minute that person starts messing up or the minute that person does something inappropriate or wrong, it, it serves as a disappointment, not to themselves, uh, but to the community, mm -hmm. to their family. And I think that's one thing that uh, I try to caution myself with is whatever you're doing, even if you do speak your mind, just make sure it's appropriate and, and, and make sure that at the end of the day you can stand by your word. Mm -hmm. uh, so although I, I tend to be very open, I, I usually think before I talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I may get to the core of Samuel Gebru, um, you're a devout follower in the Orthodox Church, yeah. which I think is really, it's, it's amazing because we belong to a generation that's incredibly skeptical that is, finds issues of identity and belonging with the Orthodox Church. And I think it's fair to say much of our generation does not go to the Orthodox Church. They, they don't really ascribe to the faith at all. How is it that you've been able to cultivate your faith and not become one of, of the skeptical ones in our generation? <laughs> or I'm sure one of your peers. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's quite common for, for our generation. It is, it is. Uh, many people, uh, you know, very close people to me, uh, you know, are beginning to question their faith. Mm -hmm. And I was always raised in the church. Uh, you know, I was, of course, baptized as an infant. Uh, I was born in Khartoum, Sudan. So, uh, you know, there's a great church there that uh, Emperor Haile Selassie ordered the construction of. And I attended all the time with my mother. Uh, when we came to the United States, I was in the children's choir, always attended every Sunday, sometimes would drag her out of bed to attend church, uh, always wore traditional Ethiopian clothes too. Uh, you know, I was very proud to be uh, Orthodox Christian, um, very proud to be Ethiopian. And for me, my religion is, is also what does drive me forward. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's very important to, to, to really realize that in, in the context of Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is not just a religion, it's a culture, it's a lifestyle, it's a, it's a, it's a way of being. Mm -hmm. It was the political structure in Ethiopia for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, Ethiopian uh, counting uh, numbers, letters, it comes from the Ethiopian Church. Music does too. And, and I think what's important is that I was able to tie all of that together, having been raised in the church, and also having a deep interest in, in Ethiopian languages, I wanted to definitely be out there and uh, embrace who I was, my identity. Not just as an Ethiopian, but as an Ethiopian Orthodox Christian. Mm -hmm. And so attending church was uh, not a sort of um, thing that you just do because everyone else does it. Mm -hmm. And it certainly was not out of convenience, but it was out of this deep sentiment that you, know, you, you had to pay respects, you had to, you had to pray, you had to, um, you had to be one in fellowship with others, and for me, you know, uh, a lot of what I do, uh, you have to thank God for, and and for me, it's always been that inspiration moving forward, 
uh, selfless acts. Uh, my, my favorite uh, Bible verse is Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are, the uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And I think that's important because, you know, peacemaker for me is beyond just settling disputes of war. It's more than that. Because at time of peace, there still is war. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, a peacemaker is somebody who not only provides outer peace to people, but also inner peace to people. So whether it is providing services, social services, uh, building schools in Ethiopia, hospitals, funding the education of midwives, cutting back obstetric fistula, that all comes back to peacemaking. Mm -hmm. you, know, you put these women at peace when they are healthy. Right. Uh, these children are at peace when they're going to school, becoming future leaders of Ethiopia, retaining the culture, retaining the identity that has kept Ethiopia alive for over 5,000 years. Why do you think it is that our generation is having such a disconnect with the church? I mean, and it's not just the church, it's with the culture. I think when you're in, in the diaspora, especially if you were born yeah. and raised here, or just raised here, it's very easy to disassociate yourself from the cultural things, such as, going, such as the Orthodox Church. Um, why do you think that disconnect is so pervasive, mm -hmm. um, in your opinion? I don't think we're actually proud to be Ethiopian. Hmm. That's why. You have many people that say, you know, uh, That's Ethiopian... That's funny, because a lot of people would say that yeah, Ethiopians yeah. are too proud. Yeah, but, you know, I think it's a very superficial level okay. of being proud. That's interesting. You know, and, and dare I say this, but I think it is, because when, when you say that you're Ethiopian, it's more than just the green, yellow, fl red that uh, is on our flag. Mm -hmm. In fact, that should be the last thing you talk about. When you say you're Ethiopian, and if somebody asks you, oh, you know, where is Ethiopia? Obviously, you'll point it on the map, but... Beyond that, if you can't defend your history, if mm -hmm. you can't defend your culture, if you can't identify with your language, these are very critical things that I, I think need to be addressed within our young community in the diaspora. A lot of us don't take the personal initiative to learn our languages. Whether it is Amharic or any other language, we don't learn it. And we don't, we don't, we don't care to learn it. We don't care to go to church, although we do complain of not understanding what the priests say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it's, it's sort of that double standard approach, I think, that, that's being taken here. And always, for me, uh, representing Ethiopia, repping Ethiopia, was not about the flag. Mm -hmm. um, because that is a very outward symbol. That is something that's very easy to represent. I just hold that up and I'm Ethiopian. But beyond that is the actual identity that you have within. Mm -hmm to know who you are, to know your history. I mean, for instance, the red on the Ethiopian flag, that's for the blood of the marchers that shed their life for Ethiopian independence. And to understand who were these marchers, what battles did they fight? Why is it so important? Why is Ethiopia today Africa's only independent nation? It was sovereign, even during the scramble for Africa. And much is to be said about this. So I think for me, there was always this interest in, in Ethiopia, and I think you know, much of it I also have to do owe to my mother. Uh, my mother really provided that traditional setting of a home uh, in terms of knowing your values, respecting your elders. Uh, you, know, you are Ethiopian first, don't forget that. You know, mm -hmm. Don't forget you are standing on the shoulders of many people who came before you. Mm -hmm. And you know, if there's a message that I would like to you know, put out there, other than running for prime minister, <laughs> is, um, is definitely that, you know, all of us are on the shoulders of many people. Um, there's thousands of years of history that we are sending on today. So, you know, we are here at the Ethiopian Embassy and that's also symbolic of that. Oh yeah. You know, because this land is technically Ethiopian. And that's important to realize. And and for us, you're standing on the shoulders of many people who shed their life. And uh, understanding your values, understanding your culture, representing who you are, is more than just a flag, is more than just listening to music, too. It's more than that. It's, it's your lifestyle. It's, it's uh, your internal identity. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad that you brought back up uh, your, your interest in running because um, it makes complete sense. <laughs> I mean, it makes complete sense. The, the amount of interest that you have um, in Ethiopia, I mean, it, like you said, it's not just surface level, it's cultural, it's socially, it's the health sector, it's, it's in every facet. 
are you seriously interested in running? I mean, you said it in an interview in, uh, at uh, the Cambridge Community Television Station that you would like to run. Does it still stand true? Do you still want to run eventually? <laughs> you know, you did your homework. <laughs> I, I think, um, God knows, I think it would be great. But ultimately, what, one piece of advice, actually, that uh, a very uh, important uh, person to me and uh, somebody who uh, led this building for a while, the former Ethiopian ambassador, Dr. Samuel Asefa, uh, said to me was, whatever you do, you have to make sure the people are behind you. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, whatever you do, you have to remember leaders are chosen by the people, not by themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing to remember. On my end, sure, I can say right here and right now, oh yeah, I'd like to be Ethiopia's prime minister. But what does that mean to the 85% of Ethiopians that live in the rural countryside? Mm -hmm do they want me to be their prime minister? You see, there's the difference. And, and my thing is, I'd rather say I'm at the disposal of the public. You know, um, there, there are people who are public servants by choice, and then there are people who are public servants by calling, by cause. And I think I'm one of those. And for me, it's really just whatever people envision. If I am meant to be um, prime minister, then that will happen. I will take it and I will do the best I can to continue being at the disposal of the people. When they don't want me, I'll leave. That's an incredibly brave thing to say. I mean, like I said, you speak openly about a lot of things, and for Ethiopians, the conversation of politics is incredibly taboo. Very. We feel incredibly uncomfortable discussing it in private and in public. Does this not, I mean, I asked you earlier, but does it not at all shake you in any way to to speak out and openly and, and to even say now that you, if they want you, that you'll, you'll be had. <laughs> and if they don't, you won't be had. Um, I think it's important to talk about it. In Ethiopian culture, a lot of things are taboo. Oh yeah. Sex oh, yeah. is taboo. Yes, talking is. about sex is taboo. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, because talking about sex is taboo, HIV AIDS spreads right. in Ethiopia because there is no sexual education. Mm -hmm. We're not we're not telling people how to put a condom on. We're not telling people how to use certain and forms of birth control yeah, right. and also abstinence and other forms. I mean, we're not telling people this. It's, it's something you, you don't talk about. I mean, you know, uh, there's a lot of uh, Facebook groups that are uh, based on being Ethiopian and, mm -hmm. you know, you know you're Ethiopian when, whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and what, one of them that strike me in particular is you never see your parents kissing. It's true. Yeah. I've never, I mean, my parents are divorced, but I've never seen any Ethiopian parent kiss in public. Never. And it's, it's interesting because certain things are taboo. But just because they're taboo doesn't mean we should be uh, following them. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it's good to break barriers. In the case of politics, Ethiopia over the past 100 years has shifted a lot. Mm -hmm. you know, in 1974, we broke away from a 3,000-year-old dynasty a 3,000-year-old monarchy that goes all the way from King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. And that was important. In 1991, we ended 17 years of Marxist rule. And then for the past 20 years, we've been doing some experiment with uh, democracy. And I think it's important to realize now more than ever, Ethiopia is at crossroads. And if Ethiopia is at crossroads, what's important to understand is that the future is now. Mm -hmm. We have the opportunity to seize it. And you know, for, for me, it's, it's really about what the people want, and it's also about the, the moment. Uh, why, why do something tomorrow when you can do it today, as mm -hmm. they say? Um, I think that's the most important thing, to, to really seize the moment, to get into it, and to do what you can at this point in time. So when it's politics, the only way we're going to become a democratic country, a full-fledged democracy that has a strong tradition, is by discussing about it. Public discourse is important. I mean, even the Greeks knew that, the Romans knew that. Mm -hmm. If you can't discuss in public, then perhaps it's not worth having a democracy. Mm -hmm. But with discussion comes responsibility. As much as you have a right to speak, you also have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. Your responsibility, I think, is more important than your right. Mm -hmm. Because in certain cases, where some of us don't like another person's uh, viewpoint, we won't let you talk. My way or the highway, mm -hmm. that has to stop. That, more than anything, is going to hurt Ethiopia de uh, democratically. 
Uh, you know, lately uh, uh, I've been uh, touting this whole idea that governments really do represent their people. Even if they're dictatorships, they do represent their people. Why? Because the mentality is the same. In the case of Ethiopia, if we're complaining that the Ethiopian government is undemocratic, then we need to think about ourselves. Are we democratic to our friends? Are we democratic to our neighbors when we're engaging in a political discussion? Or is it that I'm always right and you're always wrong? If that's the case, and if I won't even let you have the light of day with your opinion, then who am I really criticizing? Mm. The government or our culture? Ourselves? So I think it's more than just uh, the government. It's, it's the responsibility of all of us. Right. Of course, government is the upholder of the law, so naturally there's more uh, responsibility placed on the government, but at the end of the day, it's all of us. And so politics is important, uh, you know, and I come from a very non-political family, actually. My, my mother always tells me, you know, oh, I, f I forget the names of these leaders all the time. And, you know, I come home and I tell, oh, look who I met today and so-and-so is in charge of this. And she says, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> it's a headache, you know. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, you had a good day? That's great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for me, it's really understanding that we need to break barriers. We need to discuss about things in order to move forward. Right. And you spoke a little bit about your hopes for Ethiopia, but what about for yourself? What are the hopes for your future? And furthermore, what is, what's the benchmark that you've set for the yourself? Benchmark. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've thought about that actually. And when it comes to my hopes, mm -hmm. I never want to stop. I, I, I want to be for as much as I can and, and until I die, that energizer buddy that Energizer Bunny is going to be what I am, mm. on many levels. I, I want to finish my education in the United States, and when I complete that, I do want to go back to Ethiopia. I want to go back because that's my passion. I do want to go to Ethiopia, and I, and I want to continue the nonprofit work that I'm doing, maybe go into business, maybe go into politics. Really, there's uh, you know, many opportunities in Ethiopia. And for me, as long as I keep as much doors as possible open, mm -hmm. uh, I'll be able to figure out later on. So I still have time. Of course, I'm 19. Um, but in terms of the benchmark, the benchmark, really, they say reach for the stars and hope that you'll land on the moon, right? So yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> we'll reach for the stars. And if I land on the moon, then that's great. I'll place the Ethiopian flag there too. But I, I think in terms of the future, it's whatever it holds, uh, but on my end, I don't think I'll ever be done. Mm. Um, as I said earlier, it's really about following your passions. When you follow your passions and not a job description, there's no such thing as ending. You're always continuing. You know, when you retire, it's actually closing one chapter of your life and going on to another. You might be doing the same work, just different description. That was eloquently put, and thank you so much for joining us on The Benchmark. I'm sure your story is really going to touch a lot of people thank you. and spark some interest. Thank you. Hopefully. Definitely. Definitely. And uh, uh, people are more than welcome to visit us online at ethgi.org. We're on Twitter. We're on Facebook. So uh, any way that people can really come out there and support the Ethiopian Global Initiative, That'd be very helpful, and you have a great show. <laughs> thank you, Samuel. Yeah. And thank you so much for watching The Benchmark. We've been speaking with the president and chairman of the Ethiopian Global Initiative, Samuel Gebru. Like he said, don't forget to visit at ethgi.org. Also, don't forget to visit us at ebstv.tv. And to check out news about the show, go to facebook.com slash the benchmark. I'm Callie Jugu. Thanks so much for watching, and stay tuned.